Patrick Davina, so climate resilience. Now I'm going to invite our next panelists up to the stage, please. So please, can I welcome John Moreau, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Auckland Council, Jacqueline Paul, who is a lecturer at the School of Architecture at Unitech Institute of Czech Technology, and Ludo Campbell-Reed, General Manager of Auckland Council's Auckland Design Office. So here are our panelists. For those of you at home who are asking, um, slido.com, the hashtag is um, hashtag future. Um, and those of you in the room who would like to do that too, that goes straight to this iPad here. So I will start taking some questions. Please be ready. But before we do, um, I know there are three strange people on the stage who haven't really got anything, um, any knowledge about yet. So what I'm going to do is kindly ask if our panelists can sort of sum up who they are and what they do in a very, very short sentence. Ludo, if I can start with you, please. Yeah. My, oh, there we go. Uh, kia ora, everybody. Uh, Michelle, thank you. Um, look, my name is Ludo Campbell-Reed. I'm the council's design champion. I'm uh, responsible for um, uh, the Auckland Design Office, which is a team of 64 of uh, Auckland Council's finest um, looking to drive urban design into the, the heart of our decision-making at the council. Uh, I've been here 13 years, and it's probably the, the best job in the world. Kia ora, uh, huri o ngā te kanuni ki here taunga, ngā te tūwhare tō me ngā fuhi hoki. Uh, so kia ora, I'm Jackie, I'm, yeah, as mentioned, a, a lecturer at the School of Architecture at Unitec, um, and then over at AUT, uh, working with the National Science Challenge on building better homes, towns and cities, and currently on the Auckland Youth Advisory Panel for Auckland Council. Kia ora. Kia ora, koutou. Oh, man. No. <laughs> hey, look at that. Kia Help with the front. Kia ora koto, ko John Moro Takongoa, ko Takotoronga, te Chief Sustainability Officer Aho. I run the Chief Sustainability Office of Auckland Council, um, which I will uh, point out is sitting somewhere in the back there. There are some fabulous members of my team who would be happy to answer your questions because most of what I will talk about is about their collective brilliance. That's a summary, and we're getting some questions coming in. Um, in fact, lots of questions. But I'd like, I'd like to actually start, um, I'd like to start with Jacqueline, if, if that's OK. Um, look, I'm really passionate about young people, and, and we don't have, no offense, but we don't have that many young people in the room today. And by young people, I'm talking about you know, our, our next generation of children. Don't be offended by that. I'm not saying you're all old. I'm just saying that, that I work a lot with high school um, and primary school children who are passionate about the climate, who are passionate about their homes and their communities, and we don't often get to hear their voice. So Jacqueline, can I ask you, um, how do you think our young people contribute to our cities? Um, and what impact do you think they should have in, in these conversations? Cool. Oh, kia ora. So hands up if you're under 25. No, hands up if you're really under 25. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. You know, in Auckland we have such a high population of young people and yet we're not really involved in these types of conversations. Um, but like Davina's already said, you know, they're out, they're out there, they're, act, you know, activists in their own in terms of, you know, school strike for climate, uh, those, those tamariki and rangatahi out at Uhumatau. So they're out there, they're contributing to, you know, real grassroots um, korero, but it's still grassroots level. How do we kind of think about how we connect those uh, communities so that we're, we're developing more of a partnership and they're having a voice at the decision making table. You know, I'm only lucky because I sit on one of um, the Auckland advisory panels. Um, and so there, there's 21 of us on that board uh, and we're able to have a say and, you know, act as, I guess, a robust system of accountability to, <laughs> to really understand, you know, what council is doing to, uh, I guess, you know, empower rangatahi, invest in things that really affect their future. But there's still a huge disconnect because people are still making decisions that are influencing our futures for our young people, but we're not included. So how do we start shifting those conversations? I love that. Thank you so much. Um, John, I have a question for you. Yes, keep it around. Um, John, um, look, I've just come back from travelling... Um, I've just been three weeks in China and a week in Europe, and it's fascinating to just be in another city and sort of see what's going on. I love Auckland, it's my home, I'm passionate about Auckland. But th we have some challenges here. So, I mean, talking about young people is, is one factor, but actually we have a range of organizations and invested parties who sometimes challenge what we want to do and slow things down a little bit. Um, so how do you see us working together um, for big topics like climate change when there are so many different invested parties who maybe have different opinions? 
I mean, that's an interesting question because I think everything's on track and nothing's wrong. So it would be, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, so look, um, that's, that's important because I would also challenge everybody in this room um, that you know, we're all part of the problem and all part of the solution, depending on where you sit. Um, and it's, I think Michelle said it really well. You're here tonight engaging Cordero with us to figure out how we future-proof our city. And that's a really big step forward. So from my perspective, at least I could talk from what my team and I are doing around climate change with probably a lot of you in the audience as well. Um, I think there's, um, you know, there's some, I think we might hear a bit about some ingredients um, from, from my colleague Ludo, um, and I'm very curious because he has unveiled only that they're ingredients and I don't know what they are yet, so I'm nervous. Um, but I, maybe I'll talk about the recipe. And I'll talk about that getting that right in collaboration and doing things quite dramatically differently is really required. Um, I think there's nothing like climate change um, to generate a need to do something quite radical in changing how we do things. So just a couple quick examples. As we're currently with some of you in the room, and hopefully all of you by the time you leave, um, developing an integrated, inclusive, um, and intergenerational climate plan for the region. How are we going to address these issues? We're doing that right now. And in doing so, we're doing things differently. You know, of course, we're council. We don't always go completely radical. But we're, we're thinking of new partnerships. How do we engage with Montefenua, really engage in partnership with Montefenua? I will say we don't have that perfectly right. But boy, we're trying really hard. How do we engage with the private sector as a member of the Climate Leaders Coalition and actually as a large business in Auckland? We're doing things differently. We've signed up to some pretty ambitious goals and targets of how we're going to do that. Um, how do we use our platforms and, and you know, engagements like this, but also online platforms like Climate AKL to actually generate a discussion around these issues and pull that feedback into the design of the plan? And then, like you mentioned earlier on, Davina, thank you, about the climate symposium we held also in partnership um, with some of my colleagues on the panel. Um, how do we actually you know, think of when we're having a climate symposium, it's not just about um, perhaps people like Ludo and I and what we rep represent. It's actually about a diversity of opinion, and it's about engaging in a different way about issues that are climate related, but they're actually also related to intergenerational equity, a just transition, Rangatari uh, Maori uh, and Pacifica, and starting a whole new integrated set of conversations that, frankly, they're challenging. They, they really challenge us to integrate some stuff that's really difficult for us to do so. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the how is probably almost as important as the what. We kind of know what. We can look around the world. We can look to mighty Sydney and know what we need to do. But the how is actually where we win. Thank you, Joan. And, and I like that you set us up for Kororo. So um, there are going to be microphones around. So if you do have a question, get ready to put your hand up. While you're preparing to put your hand up, I'll take one from Slido right now. This is from Nick, Nick with a C. Um, Nick wants to know, how do we stop building roads and start building transport systems? Who would like that one? Start small, hey. Ludo. Shall I give it, shall I give it a go? Look, I, I think... Um, it's a great question, and it goes to the heart of, of the whole conversation today. Um, you know, Greta Thornburg and the team, you know, the young people who've been pushing the agenda, you know, the house is on fire is really what they're talking about. Uh, and the biggest emitter is, is the transportation. So hitting that conversation is really important. And so it's really understanding that, that these impacts that we're making today, and, and I understand, I guess, looking at other cities around the world, if you think about cities that have, have been pushing the agenda, you know, Vancouver back in the 70s, you know, decided, made a, made a decision that they weren't going to build any more freeways in their city. You know, London built its underground when its population was only one million people. I mean, you know, Michelle, you've just come back from China. I mean, yesterday, um, or in fact last year, uh, Shenzhen have now made their entire public transport um, system all EV electric. So there are cities around the world that are doing this, have been doing this for 20 years, and Auckland is somewhat of a late adopter in this story, and we need to get our, our show on the road. Uh, there's a sense of urgency, and, and I suppose uh, that's the, the, the issue here. So it's about integrated planning, long-term planning, but I guess perhaps it'd be challenging. Let's stop writing plans for 50 years ahead because we may not actually get there. So how about we start writing two-year plans, one-year plans, and, and drive it through that way? Okay, question from the audience. Um, where are the, can I see the microphones? The, okay, there are microphones. Can I get this man in the middle here who has his hand very high and seems very passionate? So we'll go with him to start with. That's kind of the rule, look passionate, hold your hand high, I'm, I can see you. The lights are very blinding here. So this man in the center here, thank you, sir. If you just want to introduce who you are. Can you turn that mic on? Nope, hold on. Let's just 
solve this problem. All right, sir, come over here. We're going to do this manually. <laughs> Hello, how are you? There you go. Yes, my name is Jamie Walton, and um, I first of all want to thank you for the presentations and the great work that you're doing. Um, it's telling to me that the two gentlemen in the Auckland Council don't exactly know what each other are doing. I'm just wondering how these, um, and, and even before we go talking about pr the private sector and <laughs> central government, um, how do we t turn these vertical silos horizontal and connect them up into a pipeline that delivers results quickly? Because it, we've got lots of alliances, the most, we've had alliances in the past about building motorways. The new alliances with the new government seem to be I've just read them this afternoon, they seem to be about more roads and more sprawl. How do we reverse that? We've got companies, we've got uh, investors just up at Auckland University there who have developed contactless induction charging of electric vehicles and that they're having to go overseas. We've got uh, just over the hill in Tamaki River, there's a company that wants to build e-ferries and we have some e-ferries here in Auckland. Um, quickly and to, get, to make people proud, how, how can we get some results coming and bridge the, the silos and get them connected up? Thank you so much. I like that. Do you two actually know what each other are doing? Because I think that's yeah, a good, yeah. good question. So, <laughs> that's a fantastic, we could spend the entire rest of this time talking about the answer to that question because there is sort of no clear true answer. Let me just be clear though, Ludo, Ludo and I actually do know who each other does. I was being a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, you know, urban design, sustainability and climate change are um, kind of the same thing. And I would predict that throughout this conversation we both might say things like, um, you know, with the transport and land use situation and, and government, uh, we're given a bit of a leash to say things like, you know, why are we kind of condemning people to a life in a prison, really? Um, and saying, well, you get years of hard labor um, and, um, you know, solitary confinement in enclosed communities because you have to travel in from so far. And it doesn't make sense from a sustainability point of view, from a health point of view, from a climate point of view, um, from, from any point of view. Um, I don't think we're off that song sheet. That's kind of what we're constantly talking about as thought leaders for council as bureaucrats. How to do that goes back to how I answered the previous question though. I mean, admittedly there are silos and we need to work with central government, with EWE, with um, you know uh, the corporate community, with the community groups on doing that better. And for me to stand here and say we're doing that so well would be stretching the truth. Uh, we need to constantly do this better. We welcome your feedback. But on the climate work, you know, we have signed a formal agreement with government and how we're doing this together in the large span of the zero carbon bill. So, you know, clearly there's a nesting that happens about us as an organization, us as a region, and us as a country that we can do together. And it makes common sense. The devil's sort of in the details. That's my, my quick one. Yeah, can we take another question? Do you want a quick answer? Oh, look, I mean, Cities all over the world have made decisions because of the silos that, that, that run them. Um, there's an issue, when it's wonderful having Jacqueline here tonight, you know, there is something called uh, elite projection, which is a, a, a new concept which is emerging around the world. It's people in charge tend to be elite, middle class and wealthy. And so we've got to get that diversity at the decision making table, more women, more diversity of ages, ethnicities and different views because solving this is really complex. And so people like John and I, we work horizontally across the organization. You know, that is our mantra. It's about building connected conversations around this stuff. So there are many examples. If you think about Wynyard Quarter in Auckland, that did not happen because of one silo. That happened because of a whole range of multidisciplinary public-private partnerships with central government, with the private industry, with not-for-profits. That's how we do the things well. And the best projects are always done together, but the worst ones, building motorways, are usually done in silos. And that has to stop. But it's about leadership from the top all the way through the organization. It's difficult stuff, but it requires leadership and uh, de key decision making. Questions from the audience. I like you because you're here. So, um, this lady here. Hi, my name is Lorraine. My name is. My name is Lorraine Knight. Can you hear her? No, we're gonna. It's all right. We get in there. Hi, my name is Lorraine Knight, and I live in Onihanga. And Onihanga has been turned back into a, the heap it was before. The the I understand. Um, I found out the other night that um, uh, the East-West Link has been fought for again in the um, Supreme Court, and the you know I think 
you've got to look at the vehicles going through. We, my street has been turned into basically a motorway in the last uh, few months, and with high pollution, great big trucks, very dangerous, feeding into what will be a East West Link if the National Party have their way. Now, in overseas, they're, you know, a lot of the places are saying, OK, they're only having e-cars and, you know, at least hybrids going into the city. And, and also, a lot of, a lot of uh, cities are actually looking at how to manage trucks so that you know, they haven't got all these polluting trucks everywhere. And, you know, they're not designing for trucks and things uh, that are, are polluting. You know, there's e-trucks and things like that. When are we going to get that? Yeah, that's good. Let's start with that. When are we going to get e-trucks? Go. Seems like a good start. I, I, don't want to keep, I don't want to be the person to answer all these questions, but I think, look, I'd love to hit, talk to you afterwards as well and let's, let's have a conversation because, you know, I'm not a big fan of the East-West link. You know, it's time that we stop building more roads and build more PT. Auckland is investing $28 billion over the next 10 years as part of a, a program called ATAP, and that was a partnership between central government and ourselves. Uh, most of that, 80% is going into public transport. We are building some roads, but the majority is in inactive travel, which is exciting. Exciting. Um, so, um, you know, we, we are changing and we, the last 50 years we've been building roads. So it's, a, as the mayor actually mentioned early on tonight, it's about a culture change. And that's really what Shane Ellison and his team have been charged with by his board and by government and by us. So could we catch up afterwards? Because I, I, I'm, I'm with you on a lot of that. So I don't want to take no, over the good. conversation. And that sort of ties into some questions that we're getting online. So okay. let's talk about any hunger. Let's talk about when we talk about Auckland City, what do we mean by Auckland City? Because sometimes I think when we talk about the city, we talk about central city, and Auckland is very broad. But also this great question here um, from Anonymous, um, so I don't know who you are. To what degree is the short government term of three years a handicap to building a sustainable Auckland? And I think it goes to your question there, madam, around what are we doing as projects from a government, and then suddenly government changes and projects don't take a priority. So how much is that a handicap? There you go. Big question. We've got Chris Darby here, one <laughs> of our Darby. senior councillors. Do you want to come up and be a fifth panellist? No, that's, that's <laughs> I do have an answer for that. Too. <laughs> come on, Chris. Everybody, this is Chris Darby. We now have five yeah. panellists. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't want to uh, crash the party, yourself. folks. Uh, look, uh, this probably came up, uh, Jackie's uh, referring to uh, this question that came up at uh, the conference recently, and I'm a fan. I think there's, we've got to find some fans at central government and, uh, and maybe the opposition who really want to have a crack at looking at a four-year term, because at the moment, you recover from an election, you, you find you're in office, and you know, you you paddle around a little bit, and the second year you govern, and the next third year you're getting ready for an election, and so there's one year of true government governance out of three years. And look, the answer is local government and central government. I think we've got to extend out four years at the moment. Uh, we're not cracking it. There you go. It is affecting us then, yes? And I just acknowledge that another part, I think, of some of the solutions with that is some of the work you're doing at the moment, your climate resilience work, is far extending beyond the term of the government. So it's a combination of how you look at terms, but also having long-term strategies that are bipartisan and enduring. You know, so trying to find consensus, noting there might be a change, and then trying to find a long-term trajectory, which is often the easiest part to agree on. Often the most challenging aspect is how you get there in the short term. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Hands up. Hi. Let's see if anybody's on this side. No? That lady over there. She is waving. I like waving people. Hello. Hello. Is it working? No. We try again. Aha. <laughs> I'm Professor Crumdike from Canterbury University. And I just wait, wait, heard... Wait. Is this, did you also apply? To, are you the same I, professor? Yes. Are you going to ask the... Because I... I'm just saying. You, Asking you, my question. You're like double medium. No, it's good. I'm going to delete your question now. That's well, like, here's my question because I, I had to pop my hand up because you just said vision for a change away from the roads and that. So vision, good, good, away from the roads. And you're going to build a giant parking lot to import more cars into your city on your waterfront? Just stop. Just say no. Just done. I like yes, that. Yes, no, say yes. You can say yes. two questions, very good. It, up until 1945, Auckland had the highest patronage of public transport in the whole world, okay? 
You were the number one in the whole world for PT patronage use. And more recently, you're one of the worst in the world. And we are rebuilding at a, at a faster rate than any, many other cities in the world. So our journey is a, is a journey back from the edge of, of really civilization, where we built motorways for 60 years. It's a long time to be addicted to a certain type of mobility. And so what we've got to do is we've got to start thinking about simple things which start to wean us off the motor car. And it's, it's about behavior change. It's not just about projects and it's about incentives, fiscal incentives to change the way we design our city. And so the port is part of a challenging program. The city council, the new super city is not perfect. And there are lots of silos within this organization uh, it's only six years old as a new company. You know, we've got to start to build those bridges. So we're working with the port at the moment to see how we can incorporate those car park buildings as residential buildings into the future because in time they may not be needed. But we're still importing cars and they still need to do the business. So it's really tricky and everything's a system. As Michelle said earlier, it's all linked. So understanding and treating it as a symptom of part of a whole system of things is really important. C could I just quickly chime in and say, Professor Crumdike, it's good to see you again. Um, an excellent question. And, and I, can I just encapsulate what you said and just say, you're kind of show, you're saying, go ahead and, and walk the talk. Um, and I guess adding to what Ludo just said, it's also about guts and decision making. Um, and look, I mean, I don't get to make a ton of decisions. I'm not sitting around the council table. I'm not an executive lead team member. Um, but I do play a role in helping to shape up good decisions. And so if we take the responsibility for saying, that doesn't quite look like the climate resilient, low carbon, zero carbon future that we are trying to deliver, we need to actually take a pretty strong and direct radar to see those massive inconsistencies. And we've got some. Just like as individuals, we all have those inconsistencies between our values and actually how we act every day. We need to do a bit of cl cleaning of the closet there. Um, and that's a great example. Um, but the, you know, the pattern of development is probably the biggest example. You know, if we walk the talk on climate change, we can't be sprawling. Um, we we kind of need to do a bit of a stock take. So thank you. Next question from the audience. Where are my microphones? Um, what, look, there's the lady over there. She is as far away as possible. Let's go with her because we want to see you run. Go. <laughs> She's not playing. <laughs> yes, madam, could you just introduce yourself, please? I didn't really hear the full story there. Do you mind so repeating? So London has in introduced a, what was the? London has introduced a pollution <laughs> fine. A pollution fine. I like that. That is a great question. I'm just going to repeat it for everybody on the live stream at home. Yes, yes. <laughs> Why not? Well, let's do it. Okay, yeah, so let's yeah. talk about the. Let's talk about. So London has introduced a pollution fine, apparently, um, and so can we do that here in Auckland and use the money from it to help subsidise electric vehicles, which we know are pretty much a privilege for many, um, to some of our lower income areas um, where they are having to commute because they're having to live in cheaper housing. I, th I think that kind of contradicts itself here because public transport's already expensive and not affordable. Um, we've had a huge, f you know, regional fuel tax for those low socioeconomic families and like single mums who rely on cars. So how are we going to kind of manage this within this context? Because it's yeah, we can't go one or the other, and it's too expensive to afford an electric vehicle. So we're going to walk everywhere. So how do we, you know what's the kind of transition? How do we get to that ideal where we're incentivising? Because that's so far to reach. Like we're still trying to get on the bus, you know, like baby steps. But this is the reality, you know. So, so Seoul have um, last just recently have introduced free public transport through um, during rush hour. So I think there are lots of things that this organisation, this council, the government could do to to help that process. Absolutely, and um, it's all linked again. Yeah. And, and, you know, with what Gen Zero are trying to push for around free, freeze the fears, like, that could be, uh, I guess, tactical approach around what they might look like.
then again, what you're doing within the weekends for under 15s, you know? So there's all these steps trying to get to that ideal. So, yeah. What so let's talk like? about that. Public transport. Why is nobody getting on a bus? Number one, it is no incentive, right? It's expensive, and it's usually cheaper for me to drive my car mm -hmm. than to take a bus, and I have flexibility. So how do we make it more incentivized for people to get on public transport? Winston. All right, we're on to Winston now. Yeah, I look forward to that. Winston Peters, please, can everybody have a gold card? I like this so lady. It is irrefutable. Can I just say, it's irrefutable that cost plays a major role in determining what mode someone's going to take, um, which is why I brought my bike here, because it's the cheapest way of getting around. Um, there's also a range of other things that are really, really fiercely important here and elsewhere in the world. And part of those are things like convenience or safety or frequency. And frequency is often at the top of the list of really, I mean, I'm not going to dispute, cost is huge. We've looked into road pricing. London's doing amazing stuff. We've continued to talk about road pricing. We should continue to talk about road pricing and thinking about those who are going to feel the pain of a, of a policy like that the most and using the money to offset that pain. So I'm totally with you. We also need to think about public transport and frequency. And if we don't, even if it's cheap, People won't get on a bus that comes every hour. You, you should not have to think about when you need to go catch the bus. You should just instinctively go there. John's points are absolutely right. I, I just, the trouble with, I don't want to sound defensive, okay, and I, I hope I'm not. Um, there are things that this organization does and the council does and Auckland does which I, I fight and I'm anti. But one of the things we've done best is the new bus um, rollout of the new bus network. It is fantastic. It was a nightmare before. It is the fastest growing element of our transport system today. Um, it is much more easy, much more convenient. And all those things that John said are absolutely need to be in place. The, the issue is, is getting people to try it and to start to, once you've tried and once you start to buy, but two weeks free public transport for those that don't currently use buses and let them start to see how that feels because the system's brilliant and it's only just beginning. So I don't want to just, I don't want to champion the good stuff just because it is really good. It was awful before and we're going through this rebuilding process. So, you know, I, I don't want to criticize when it's not, not, not due. No, I like that. Um, John, though, I thought I liked you, but don't give me your cyclist thing. Like, it's great that you cycled here, and that is a privileged position to be in. Number one, you can afford a bicycle, and yeah. number two, you live close enough that That's right. you can cycle. And we're That's talking right. about people. Auckland is a big place, and I don't think yeah. cycling is always... Uh, brave yeah. enough. Brave enough. Yes, that lady there. And so it's brave. great that you can get on your bike, but I'm not sure it's a solution for all people, um, unless you can get Go, all your kids and your family and your cats. Write a reply. Bike. Write a reply. Can I, can I, can I just jump You can jump totally come back. Yeah, this is um, I take your point. It's a very good point. It's a very good point. And in fact, yes, I will agree with you. I'm in a privileged position where I live very close and I could just ride my bike in. Yeah, and, and I'm able-bodied. Able if you go, so I've been to a bunch of cities, as many of us have. Um, you know, a lot of them tend to be in Scandinavia that we talk about. But when you look at um, the average age on a bike or the average gender in some of these city, cities, it's actually kind of remarkable that you will find people almost into 100 years actually on a bike because it's safe, it's convenient, people also aren't going far. So I think the point we were trying to make earlier is actually the design of our city, if you fast forward 50, 60, 70 years, if we set up a city where you don't have to bike in 20 kilometers, you could actually just take your bike to go across like you know, a kilometer, or you can actually just go down the street. Um, that's the kind of city that I have in my mind that is actually accessible to many more people, and, and, and people across the age, gender, background uh, spectrum. Um, so, so yes, I agree. Right now, it doesn't work for everybody, and it can't the way it works, so let's change it. Thank you. I am still your friend, though. Thank you. Um, can we ask this lady there? She's got some blonde hair. She has a hand held high, and she looks very happy, and I'm hoping so she's going to ask us a big question with a working microphone. Yes. Hello. My name's Hannah. <laughs> Hi, Ludo. <laughs> um, I'm studying geography at UOA. I'm in my final semester, and my question today is, how do we solve the disconnect in our city? Um, I think one of the big issues, I used to live in London, I think one of the biggest issues in Auckland is how suburbs are so difficult to get between. Yes, like it's great. I live, on, I just, I live just off Dominion Road and it's so easy to get in and out of the city, but it's so difficult to get to other parts of the city 
And as I don't own a car, I usually have to rely on other people to get me to other places or Ubers, which is very expensive sometimes, just to get home safe or just to get to another part of the city. Um, like, how is that going to be solved? Like, it shouldn't, I shouldn't have to travel into the city for half an hour to then go out again to another part. I think what I think should happen is Auckland needs more hubs. It can't just be focused in the CBD anymore. Great question. How do we connect our suburbs to each other, not just the city centre? Anybody want to take that on? Anybody? I, I, I want to, but I, again, it's about the rest of the team here. I, I, th there's so many answers around these questions that, you know, th there, there's, a pro there's a program in place. Uh, it's not perfect. It's been underinvested for 50 years. So that's my first point. The second point is City Rail Link is not about the city centre or the CBD as we used to call it. So Michelle's absolutely right. The City Rail Link will double the efficiency of the entire rail network. You'll be able to get in from Manukau, which currently takes over an hour within 20 minutes. It changes the way we think and where we think about our city. Light rail is then the next part of the layer of the transport system, which again Michelle mentioned earlier. We don't have it. We used to have it. And we're now about to build the first line, for the, which is the first time in 50 years. It was ripped up by the government in 56. So we're a long way back from where we need to be. And that will cost money. And so it's really thinking about how this whole thing links. Um, Panuku are working across the region. Manukau, Onehanga, Northcote, building these regional, sub-regional centres, putting these parts of the foundations in place for a city which starts to be more sustainable. And I guess I mean, maybe my question, maybe back to Davina here, is perhaps to bring her into this, is, you know, what is the role of the private sector in, in, in making this happen? Because at the end of the day, the government doesn't have enough money. You guys have money. You've got investors. You've got people... We need to work in partnership with you, and what's your role in that? Do you mind if I sort of, yeah? Where we've seen this done well internationally, there's a concept of what you call value capture, yeah. where, where there's higher investment from, you know, government or, you know, um, council, wh whichever form of government it is, and that's matched by higher development fees in whatever form as a form of value capture because those properties will have higher value because... People want to live in livable, walkable locations that are connected to transport. So if we look at some of the international examples, we see that's been done really well in Hong Kong yeah. and there's some connected links in Singapore. I don't claim to have the answer, you know, in its entirety, but noting that, you know, often the, the most successful elements of this have become in tripartite um, partnerships where there's been an investment from another source to boost the kind of radical change that you need to see. And there's a number of international models. And, you know, whilst Auckland's on its journey, it's good to see that you're looking at how you can accelerate those with different kinds of partnerships. Great. So that's exactly the, the way in which we're going to pay for these things because we just don't... We're not a wealthy country and we need the private sector. We need their intelligence, their innovation and their money to partner with us. So uh, the light rail project, that's a pu perfect public-private partnership. Um, worth a lot to the people that along the corridor, but are worth a lot to the investor who invests in your company. Yes. Could I, could I add a very short phrase and just say, I've said this before in forums like this, so apologies for repeat customers. Um, let's stop doing the dumb things, you know, because they cost money too. And if we stop doing the dumb things, we'd have money to do the better things. I like that. Can you write me a dumb things list and then we can just... Yeah call people out. That would be great. Okay. Uh, question. We haven't gone over that side of the room. That lady there, she is waving. She knows the rules now. Let's go there. Hi there. Um, just talking about doing the dumb things and public-private partnerships. I'm the design strategist at Spark Arena. And since last year, we've... Um, well, um, we have to serve drinks to people. They come to concerts. They like a beer. Um, because of the health and safety, we can't give you a glass. So we serve you a disposable um, single-use cup. And since last year, all of our cups have been made of cornstarch and they are composted and we make sure that they go to the correct place and are composted. Um, that represents a million cups a year and we've saved um, from our projections over 55 tonnes going to landfill in the last six months. Um, we did this because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, because we live in this city, we're humans, and we think we should turn the tap off and not just mop the overflowing bath. Um, 
we've taken a lead very publicly. We've had a lot of people come to the building since we've done it, and we haven't had any buy-in from any public organization. I've tried to be in touch with the Ministry of the Environment, who fobbed me off telling me I could sign up to some stupid thing that would give me a logo. Nobody is interested in what we're physically doing on the ground. And this is, you, you're talking grand schemes, 10 years, 20 years, and Ludo nailed it when he said, you know, we should be finding results in two years. We've had results within weeks of what we've done. And I went down to the Auckland Arts Festival and I was given a polystyrene cup. Shame on you, Auckland Council. Yes, that lady. I don't, I don't think we need to come back from that. I think she's made her point. I don't, I don't want to hear from the panelists. They have nothing better to say than that lady there. Okay, next question. <laughs> this, this young man here. Uh, hello, everyone. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Fred. Um, I'm, from, I'm from Melbourne originally, and Hi, I'm Fred. studying here in Auckland, studying urban planning. I was very pri privileged to be part of John's team recently. Um, my question is about... I live in Onehunga now, and Panuku is doing uh, some redevelopment there, and I, when I go to the shops in the evening, I see a lot of diverse range of people in Onehunga, and I love that about Onehunga, and it's great. Um, but how do we bring these people along in terms of the plans for um, Only Hunger and how do we engage with a broad spectrum of people outside of the uh, bubble? And I think everyone knows what I mean when I say the bubble. Cool. Jacqueline. Um, yeah, kia ora. Did the Only Hunger like, community round up and all come together? <laughs> um, no, that's, such a, that's a great question because, um, you know, you guys have the 312 hub, you know, focus around young people there, and I know the team from Panuku are here as well. Um, and, and so they're doing some awesome stuff around uh, changing, I guess, some of these social procurement investment in terms of young people, how they're employing them, um, and doing some really placemaking based stuff. It's just... I guess tapping into those existing networks that are there and ensuring that you're changing the way we communicate in terms of council and those in the community. But I think they're doing some great stuff out there, um, and, but that's come from the community there. So maybe you need to, yeah, he, have you been involved in the 312? Ah, oh, there you go, we'll send you an invite, <laughs> get you there. Because it, you know, that's a great community um, and yeah, it would be awesome for you to connect with the uh, team back over there, Nico, uh, from Panaku. so kia ora. No. Me no. One last question. <laughs> this Shut lady down. here who has been patiently waiting, and I'm afraid that is going to be our last question of the evening. So we have run out of time. Uh, I'm a grandmother, very concerned about my ch grandchildren's future. Um, I've spent a reasonable amount of time in Holland, and their public transport is free for all students, university students. I went with a young friend who was at university some years ago, I got a 40% discount just because I was traveling with her. Now, I'm not saying that's okay, but... I like this, I bring a friend on the bus and you get a by discount. The, by the time those kids get yeah. to the age where they have to start paying, and that's once they've finished their university degrees or their training, they have already mm -hmm. got a very well-established habit of using public transport. Yeah, I like that. So basically... <laughs> I'm with you. And I guess it's a, it goes back to affordability, right? Is that what it is? Is, is it a money discussion? Could I just put out an idea that might get me fired? Um, what if everybody who makes decisions about public transport use or uh, use council level actually committed to taking public transport yes. at least once a week, you know, to actually see what, the, what, con what constraints there are, how difficult it is. I mean, look, we're all trying to move the ball in the same direction here, but I think actual lived experience of what the challenges are would, would really dramatically change how you make those decisions. And better yet, if those people making decisions, right back to democracy, if they represented Auckland a bit better, with due respect to, to Chris Darby, who is an absolute champion in this space, Pippa Coombe, who is as well, but they need a little bit of backup from, from the rest of the community with age diversity, gender diversity, ethnicity diversity. And if those people are taking public transport too, We'll be making much better decisions. We'll get to Holland. I like that, John. John, look, I'm a doer, not a talker. So I, what I need from you is a list of people that we can stalk. That would be great. Um, and we can see how they get to work if they're making public transport decisions. And then we can have some bigger conversations with them. Do you like that? Should we do that? That would be quite fun. Hey. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time because I think we could have this conversation all day. Ladies and gentlemen, please, will you thank Davina Rooney, John Moreau, Jacqueline Paul, and Ludo Campbell-Reed for us. Thank you so much. Close our conversation.
conversation tonight, I would like to introduce Andrew Eagle, CEO NG. NZGBC to the stage to say our farewells and close the ceremony. And I am out of here. Thank you so much for coming out. Andrew, where are you? There he is.